Well, good afternoon, everybody. There are still people joining as I speak. So uh, excuse me if you can actually see it on my screen. Welcome to February's Power Hour. And uh, our guest speaker is Chris Slight, Managing Director of Highway Research, who I will introduce shortly. I'm Joanna Oliver. Uh, a lot of you know me. I uh, look after all the international programs, events and conferences for the CEA. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about FutureWorks later on as well, uh, which is our exciting new project for this year. Quickly run through the rules of the CEA house. As always, it's run uh, in accordance with our corporate compliance rules, copy on the website. The uh, Webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website along with the slides and we'll send a link round after the webinar. Uh, please don't forget to stay on mute and if you'd like to ask a question and we, we encourage you to do so, please uh, put it in the chat box. Uh, keep your video turned off just to keep all the bandwidth free and uh, if anything goes horribly wrong and it is very windy up here in Yorkshire, um, we're doing our best to keep the show on the road. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Chris Slight, Managing Director of Ohio Research. Um, Chris is a graduate of Aston University with degrees in engineering and civil engineering. Um, he then went on to work with the KHL group, uh, eventually editing Construction Europe and uh, international construction magazines before he moved on to off highway research which is I think you all know um, specialist market research uh, and forecasting company in the global off highway sector and also which includes uh, construction equipment and agricultural tractors. Uh, Chris became MD of off highway research in 2018 and um, in addition to all the above Chris is an old friend of both the CEA and myself, and uh, Chris and I might have had the odd drink in ooh, at least five continents, if not six around the world, but uh, hardly any at all has passed our lips. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, Chris, over to you. Lovely. Thank you, Joanna, um, for that uh, near libelous introduction. Um, Afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here presenting at the, at the Power Hour again. Um, I'm, I've sort of got a, a presentation of two halves for you today. Um, we're going to try and do a quick update on, on 2021. Um, at Off Highway Research, we're, we're right in the middle of updating our figures for 2021, so I can't bring you um, those numbers. They'll be out in, in about three or four weeks. Um, but we are going to take a look at some of the information which is out there. Um, then I'm going to move on to um, a slightly different way of looking at the market, which we've developed over the last year, which looks at sales from the point of view of customer groups um, and gives, gives a different perspective on, on how you can view the market and how you can view trends. So as, as Joanna said, I'm, uh, I, I'm with Off Highway Research, uh, which for the last six or seven years has been owned by KHL Group, a, a major media company in this space. As Off Highway Research, we have offices in all the strategic markets uh, in the world, and obviously being part of a much bigger media group, uh, we have access to, to a very large network uh, across the globe. So just to look at uh, 2021, um, as I said, our, our data is not, not quite there yet, but most of the indications we're getting are that 2021 was a record year in terms of the number of machines sold around the world. Um, I think, you know, the positives you're, you're probably all familiar with, there's been a very pronounced bounce back uh, from the COVID affected uh, year of 2020. In fact, that bounce back started pretty much in, in the second half of 2020. Uh, the key drivers of that have been strong residential activity, and that's to some extent, a worldwide phenomenon. Um, the, the move to home working has, has prompted many people who, who are able to, to move to bigger properties or to extend their existing properties. And of course, that's helped by um, extremely low interest rates around the world. 
More recently, we've obviously seen the stimulus spending programs being announced. And, you know, while you could have a bit of a debate about whether that's actually happening on the ground yet, I think the really crucial thing about these stimulus programs and infrastructure programs is they give people the confidence to invest in equipment. They, they give them the belief that there's a pipeline of work um, that, will, that will justify a new machine purchase. Uh, the negatives, uh, again, I, I'm sure are equally well known, and I'm sure many of you have felt a lot of pain from these. Um, the issues around component supply uh, are obviously acute. I, I've not spoken to anyone in the last year who said we're fine on component supply. Uh, many people have, have their headaches, and I'm not really hearing anyone say, yes, we're over it, uh, it's going to be okay. I, th I think people are still in the middle of that although there are some indications that it may be easing. And of course, intertwined with that is the issue of shipping, uh, the availability of shipping and the cost of shipping. And that's in terms of both getting the materials and the components to the factories to make the machines, and then getting the machines out to customers wherever they may be in the world. Um, so that, that's uh, certainly been a headache for, for pretty much anyone you'd care to speak to in this industry over the last 12 months. And what, what sort of comes with that is the, the inflationary pressures, which again, we're feeling as consumers and we're seeing in the environment of, of rising interest rates. But obviously that is also a, a factor for manufacturing businesses that are having to pay more for components, to pay more for shipping and so on. Uh, so that, that's certainly been the major problem. The other issue I'd point to in terms of the market is um, the bounce back in 2020 was very much led by China. Um, that lasted pretty much 12 months, and from April, May last year, uh, the Chinese market did slow down quite, quite markedly and continues to do so. So we, we, we sort of wait to see how all those factors intertwine in, in terms of what 2021 finally looks like in terms of uh, sales, and then the outlook for each region obviously dictates how we see the forecast. But, but what we can look at and, and what is pretty much out there now are uh, quarterly revenues. So what we do with this is we've identified a group of about 19 or 20 um, of the household names in construction equipment. So um, the Caterpillars, Komatsus, John Deere's, Hitachi's, all the companies that we can find that are listed on a stock market somewhere, uh, obviously report quarterly revenues. Uh, we aggregate them, um, convert them to US dollars where where we need to in the, in, at, a, at an exchange rate we determine as being average over the period. Um, and what that gives us is, is a very, very pretty wavy graph which shows the, the cycle of the industry. So this goes back to 2014. <clears throat> the more recent history of this, industry, there's obviously a, a sort of a normal peak, if you like, in 2018 and 2019 when uh, when the market kind of came back from this, this mid-decade low and, and hit, a, hit a pretty much record high then. Uh, the market was turning down at the end of 2019. That was very clear in, in Q3 and particularly Q4. And then of course in 2020, COVID really struck somewhat in the first quarter, but particularly in the second quarter, that was sort of the low point of the pandemic as far as it impacted on, on sales in this industry. What you see from, from Q3 onwards is, is a pretty sharp rebound um, right up until uh, the middle of last year. There was a bit of a dip in the third quarter, but you know that, that's actually a normal seasonal thing. In any given year, the, the third quarter is normally the weak one. And then these results that we've just had in uh, for Q4, um, it was the best quarter in terms of sales uh, that this industry has ever seen. Um, and actually, even though Q3 was, you know, looks kind of low on this graph, uh, Q3 last year was also the best third quarter that this industry has ever seen. So it did take a little while to get going at the start of last year, but, but a very strong second half. So if you look at that in, in terms of annualizing those quarters together, you'll see the, the column for 2021 is just a little bit ahead of this last peak that we saw in, in 18 and 19. Uh, I, would, I would stress again, you know, this, this is the international OEMs. We, we do also monitor um, the larger Chinese OEMs, but they're not included in this graph. We don't have, have the figures yet. 
So this this is um, you know kind of the the more familiar major international groups, um, and obviously their fortunes are more more dependent on um, Europe, North America, and and other sort of traditional markets rather than China. So yeah, as I said, uh, record second half last year, and then record revenues in 2021. However, if you look at operating margin, and that's shown by this gray line on the right hand scale. So in the previous peak of 2018, 2019, um, the, the industry margin was um, up above 12%, um, touching 13% in 2018. Of course, that fell in 2020. You know, probably not as far as it might have done. Um, dropping down to about a 9% operating margin was frankly not a bad result, uh, considering how, how dire the, the, the global situation felt um, two years ago. Um, and there has been a rebound in 2021. The, the margin across the course of the year is coming out at sort of 11.5%. Um, but, but there is an important point here in that, you know, revenues are on a par with 2018 and 2019, and, and margin is not. Um, not by much, you know, it's still, it's still quite a good margin for this industry historically, but given that we have record sales, um, it is obviously striking that we're not having record profits as well. And then when you look at it um, on, a, on a quarterly basis, you do kind of see quite an interesting trend. So, of course, the, the margin was at its lowest in, in the second quarter of 2020, and rebounded with sales right through uh, into the first quarter of 2021. Then what you've seen from 2021, uh, from that first quarter of 21 onwards, is that the margin has deteriorated and actually the decline has steepened in the fourth quarter of last year, even as, um, even as revenues have, have hit a record level. So yeah, in terms of, in terms of revenues, great. Um, but, you know, we feel very strongly that um, this issue around margins very much relates back to um, supply chain shipping and, uh, and cost issues, inflation issues that we're seeing in the industry. Um, and that, that's something that you see when you dive into the, the financial reports. Um, you do see price increases shown in, in the breakdown. Um, and that, that is a major factor for, for everyone in this industry. Uh, having said that, um, you know, demand out there remains extremely high and much higher than, than any manufacturers can fulfill. Um, so the, not many companies in this industry report order intake and, and order backlog, but those that do, um, it has just climbed and climbed throughout um, 2021, possibly slowed down a little bit in, in the fourth quarter but still at historic levels, the, the book to bill ratios and the order backlogs are extremely high. Um, you know, again, you'll, you'll obviously know what's going on in your own businesses, but it is fairly common when we speak to the industry for OEMs to say, we, we are sold out for this year. Um, you know, order what you like and we'll get it to you when we can in 2023. I think when you see a situation like this, you, you do have to question how real the demand is. Um, it, it can be the case that because everyone's crying out for equipment, um, distributors order more than they need on the anticipation that there'll be an allocation and it, the allocation will bring it down to what they actually need. Um, so, so there can be those, those games being played. You know, frankly, I don't know the answer to that. Um, my, my feeling tends towards that the demand is real. Um, what we hear from OEMs is it's not just dealers ordering, but you know they walk around the factory floor and they see a customer name on the machine being built. And I think one of the things that stems from is, is obviously in 2020 when the pandemic hit, everyone absolutely emptied out their inventory. So inventories have been extremely low um, you know, for, for almost two years now. Um, with this very high demand, um, it, it does really feel like it's, it's genuine or it's certainly uh, certainly heading that way. Um, however, and I'll come on to this in, later on in the presentation, the, the point I would make is that, 
you know, from, from 2018, 2019, which were cyclical highs, um, global sales were still fairly high in 2020. Obviously, 2021, we feel, will be a record. And then with everything we hear uh, about demand out there and, and backlogs, we think 2022 will also be an extremely high year for, for global equipment sales. So you've got five years of you know, pretty much record sales in a row. And that is extremely unusual in this industry. Normally the peak of the cycle lasts one or maybe two years and then, then falls away reasonably quickly and uh, reasonably far. So one of the issues with this is that with this very much prolonged peak, the population of young equipment in the market is really growing. And the, that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as there's work to do. But if, if construction activity falls away, um, it suddenly be, can very quickly become a barrier to sales of new equipment because people are looking out, contractors or, or whatever, looking at their order books and saying, all right, it's slowing down, we'll stop buying equipment. We've got, uh, we've got plenty in our, in our fleet that can do the job where we'll just put CapEx on hold for six months, a year, two years or whatever. And, and so when you get this sort of bubble of, of young machines built up, uh, any, any fall in activity and the fundamental driver can, can really hurt the, the new equipment sales. Um, so that is a concern at the moment. It's not an immediate concern, but obviously we're in this environment of, yes, there's stimulus spending, but interest rates are going up. Uh, the indications are in some countries they're about quite aggressively. That will cause an economic slowdown. The other post-pandemic impacts that will, will slow down economies. So I think, you know, possibly for 2023 onwards, that, that is a concern that we have about the general outlook for the industry. Um, as I said, um, and not wishing to do a shameless plug, we're, we're working very hard putting these figures together now. Uh, we will discuss these in a webinar on the 29th of March. Um, our, it's a regular sort of quarterly thing that we do called the Off Highway Global Briefing. Um, if you'd like to join that, it's a paid for webinar, but um, very reasonably priced. Please visit offhighwaybriefing.com and you can book your ticket with a credit card there. So on to part two, um, which is... Normally when I give these presentations, we look kind of purely at the markets and the ups and downs uh, by equipment type. Um, a, new, a new thing that we've developed um, over the last year is to look at equipment sales in terms of customer types and to try and tease out some of the trends and, and some of what's happening there. Um, we've produced this data for Europe and that's available. Uh, we'll also shortly be launching our, the data we have for China and India as well. Um, but, but for the second half of the presentation, I was just going to run you through what we're seeing in Europe, um, what that's shown us about the main buyer groups, uh, and how, the, how, how sort of different markets and different equipment types have different profiles. So, um, first of all, the structure of the market in Europe. Um, the highest volume machine by far is the mini excavator. In the off-highway research lexicon, a mini excavator is a machine of six tons operating weight or less. Uh, anything heavier than that is a crawler or wheeled excavator. Um, yeah, so mini excavators have grown over the years. Um, this increase in residential activity that we saw you know, effectively as a result of the pandemic has seen an increase in mini excavator sales in, in 2020. And this, uh, this period, from 21 onwards is our forecast looking out ahead. So mini excavators are an extremely uh, important product in terms of volumes in, in Europe. The other high volume products are wheel loaders um, and obviously compact wheel loaders are a, a very important volume product in certain markets like Germany. Crawler excavators are of course pretty much ubiquitous across Europe. Um, telehandlers, again, another very high volume product um, split somewhat between agriculture and construction in Europe, and I'm going to come on to that later. And then you get into the areas that are more niche. Uh, wheeled excavators are a very important product in, in Germany and, and France and certain other markets, but in other, in other countries in, in Europe, they tend to be a little bit specialised. And then you have um, 
things that has used to be big but are becoming niche uh, skid steer loaders and backhoe loaders uh, you know still have a place but um, aren't really the the high volume machines they once were and then this others group um although it's not very big in unit terms they tend to be the heavier earth moving machines so they are very significant in value terms so we're talking about things like dump trucks dozers graders uh, things of that type in that group so that that's a quick overview of how the market in europe is constructed in terms of who buys these machines um we identified uh, nine i think uh customer groups um within our reports we break this down in in a lot finer detail so obviously contractors uh, you know, various different types and sizes but for the purpose of a database and for comparing country to country and uh, product to product we standardized um i think the first key point is that rental is just um the biggest buyer of equipment in europe um a little bit over 37 percent um and contractors just a little bit under obviously they show as equal because of rounding errors here um but that was not the case 10 years ago 10 years ago overall contractors were um were the biggest buying group the other significant ones which you know some of which may be surprising agriculture is the third biggest group although obviously quite quite significantly smaller than either rental or contractors um and that that is partly because of the very high number of telescopic handlers that are sold to agriculture in Europe. Um, landscaping is an interesting one. We can sometimes struggle with the definition of that, but that would be any activity which um, sort of maintains a, a, a landscape which is already established as opposed to earth moving, which would be contractors establishing a, a landscape. Um, that has emerged in the last couple of years as an, an important segment in certain countries uh, and obviously very much for uh, compact equipment. The extraction industries and mining and quarrying in terms of unit sales, and that's what we're looking at here, relatively small, but obviously the, the size of machines that are used there are, are pretty large. So as a um, as a as, as, as sort of a value segment, which we'll look at next, it's more significant. Similarly, waste management, recycling and demolition has, has come quite a long way in, in the last couple of years. Um, it's relatively small in unit terms, um, but again, more significant in value terms. And then after that, you get a couple of niches, um, general industry applications, which are kind of quite hard to break down further, uh, a small, some machines are still bought by the public sector by local authorities um, forestry and timber is is important in some countries but not all and then there's the final three percent that's just really annoying and hard to classify so we put it as others so that's how the the market breaks down in unit terms in in value terms and this this is more a sort of an extrapolated number i would say it's it's hard to be that specific with this analysis um, but in value terms, contractors are much more important on, on a European level um, because they tend to buy the bigger equipment. Rental is still significant, but um, because of the focus on, on smaller machinery, um, in value terms, it, it's obviously less so. Uh, as I said, extraction, the focus on big heavy equipment means the value of the segment is important. Um, and that sort of swaps places with agriculture, which again tends to be lighter equipment. Um, and likewise, waste management, recycling and demolition tends to be heavier machines, so, so greater value. So it, it does illustrate the point that high volume um, is, is very much not the same as high value in, in construction equipment. Um, the other thing that, that I wanted to go into is just to sort of make the point, which hopefully you, you would expect, is that um, the buyer profile for different machine types is very, very different. Um, I'll show you two extremes here, but across Europe, mini excavators, uh, about half are bought by rental companies. It's still a very important product for contractors, um, probably not so much in the, in the UK, or in fact, definitely not so much in the UK. Um, but in other parts of, of Europe, uh, contractors do like to own their equipment, and that often means a mini excavator. Um, also quite an important product in, in landscaping and these these public sector, local government type, type 
organizations that buy them, obviously a, an interesting machine for sort of urban utility repairs. <clears throat> if you contra contrast that with something that's at the other end of the scale, like a crawler dozer, a completely different profile, contractors are by far the most uh, important buyer group there. Still a fair number going into rental fleets, which, which I think is interesting and makes the point that rental is not just compact equipment, but it spans a um, pretty wide range of equipment. Um, and then you have the, the other areas where you'd expect to see a dozer in, in mines and quarries, in, in certain waste management applications, and, and also in industrial applications. Um, the other thing which comes out of this data is that um, if you go from country to country in Europe, the sort of buyer profile is completely different. Um, the UK is an extreme, and I'm going to talk about the UK in, in more detail later, um, but I've just picked it as, as one end of the spectrum, where rental is hugely dominant. Two thirds of machines uh, in volume terms are sold to rental companies in the UK. Uh, contractors are a very small slice compared to um, what you would see in other countries. So, uh, you know, another the other end of the scale would be typically a southern European country where rental is established but uh, hasn't really come as far. So there you still have contractors as very much the, the dominant force. Um, rental is, is kind of coming along in, in most countries in Europe but in, in a lot of countries is still very much secondary to contractor ownership. And then you get um, the niches sort of distributed slightly differently, depending on how important they are and, and whether there are other equipment types that, that are used that are maybe outside off highway research's coverage. <clears throat> so moving on to how this has changed in Europe, I think, you know, the first thing to say really is it hasn't changed a great deal. Um, we, it is, you know, the, the rise of rental is talked about um, in, in continental Europe, and it is a factor, but it's not a, a sudden sort of uh, upward line that's happened in, in the last 10, 15 years. It's very much a, a gradual progression that's, that's been going on for a couple of decades, really. Um, having said that, there are small changes that are discernible here, and obviously rental back here in 2010 was um, actually second to contractors, and we have seen that flip around, although you do see that there is a little bit of undulation year to year. Um, that's not so much about the popularity of rental rising or falling. It's more about which countries are in the ascendancy. Um, so obviously if there's a big boom in UK equipment sales, um, that's actually enough to, to turn the dial on, on how much machinery is sold to rental companies, um, looking at it at, at a European level. Um, and equally, you know, if a very contractor dominated uh, market picks up suddenly, um, it, it kind of swings the dial the other way. Um, yeah, so rental and contracts are sort of trading places a little bit, um, but there has definitely been a, a pickup in rental sales. And then many of these, these niche areas remain relatively unchanged. So as I said, it's, it's hard to see the, the big changes on, on a chart like that, but I'll just kind of run through it in terms of numbers. So if you went back to, to 2010, um, contractors were, you know, rental and contractors have always been close, but contractors were very clearly the dominant channel in Europe. Um, that flipped round by about 2021, and as I said, you know, rental was ahead, uh, if only by a rounding error. Um, and our outlook to 2025 does does see that falling away a little bit. Um, and again, that that's kind of a function of um, more which countries we we see rising and falling within Europe, um, rather than you know people have kind of changed their mind about rental. Um, yeah, so I mean, the headlines there are the rise of rental, the, the rise of landscaping, and also, you know, maybe as you might expect, the rise of uh, the waste and, and demolition industries, obviously, the, the pressure to, to recycle um, mounts year on year. So you would expect those, those industries to, to get a little bit bigger. Um, I'm just going to sort of present that in a slightly different way, just, just to draw out a few other things. Um, what I've done in this table is just put in the change between 2010 and our sort of projected 2021 figures. 
um, and taken that back to a compound annual growth rate. So on average over the last 10, 11 years, the, the European equipment market has grown 6% per year. So what I've done here is shown anything ahead of that in, in green and anything behind that in red. So again, you know, it shows, it shows about the same things. We've seen the growth areas to be rental and uh, landscaping. One that's fallen back or is, is somewhat behind the growth rate are the extraction industries. Um, there are a couple of things that, that may be driving that. Um, first of all, it's, it's a consolidating industry. Um, you've seen a lot of the major aggregates and indeed uh, mining companies uh, merge. And but obviously with that comes a certain amount of closures of sites. Um, you've also seen mining in general decline in, in Europe over a period of years. I think the other thing to say about extraction, and this comes back to the point that here we're talking about sales in unit terms, is that it is one industry in particular where you tend to get, um, when things are refleeted, you tend to get people moving to fewer, bigger machines um, as a driver of productivity. So even if the number of machines might be falling a little bit, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the value of the extraction industries is diminishing, although there may be factors that mean they are. Um, the other growth areas, as I said, waste recycling and demolition, actually probably one of the strongest growth areas in Europe, um, although it is effectively a niche. Um, and again, the industrial applications, there's, there's a whole host of things in there, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't really wish to dive in too deeply. But, you know, I, I think it does illustrate the point that when you look at the, the overall figures for Europe, when you dive into it, there are a lot of different things driving it, uh, some of which you might expect, such as the waste recycling and demolition stuff, and some of which is, is perhaps less obvious. Um, so just, just um, sort of a semi-closing remark, I'm just going to dive in a little bit on the UK, um, which is just an odd market when you look at it in this way. Uh, rental is enormous in the UK. Uh, as I said uh, earlier on, about two thirds of equipment sales in unit terms go to, rental go to the rental industry. And the contractor segment in, in relative terms is really quite small, you know, just sort of 10 to 15% of demand. Whereas the European average, as we've seen, is 37%. And in most other countries outside the UK, it's, it's obviously much higher than that. Um, so, yeah, as far as we can tell, you know, the, the UK is probably the most developed rental market in the world. Um, you certainly don't see these these sort of rental penetration rates anywhere else in Europe. Um, it seems to be somewhat ahead of what we see in North America. I think the only country that possibly comes close to it is, is Japan. Um, but I suspect that at, at two thirds of sales, the, the rental penetration of the UK is the highest of, of anywhere in the world. Um, yeah, I, I think that the point that kind of flows from that is it's not just the kind of what people think of as rental products, you know, mini excavators and compact equipment. In the UK, rental flows through many, many um, much larger equipment classes and indeed into certain sort of essentially specialist machine types, um, which is something that you don't really see in other markets. Um, as I said before, the, we're looking at construction equipment here. We're not considering tractors at all. But in, in the UK, agriculture is quite a big buyer of construction equipment. And that's obviously compact machines and, and particularly telehandlers. Um, and, and likewise, the, the waste management uh, demolition sector is, is also relatively large compared to the rest of Europe. Um, so just to sort of flip that around and look at the UK market in terms of, let's look at the, the buyer groups, what kind of profile do they have? So if you look at contractors, which, you know, over the last couple of years have bought, you know, just over 4,000 machines per year, there's still quite big buyers of, of these machines which go to, to rental fleets, mini excavators, but they also buy things that are, that are kind of pure contract machines like pavers. You do have a few companies in the UK which rent out pavers, but not many. Um, but there, there are machines in, in this profile which you would consider sort of the classic thing that's bought by contractors. 
Um, when you contrast that with rental companies, again, you know, the, the big ones are the ones you would expect. Mini excavators, um, crawler excavators, telehandlers are very important. But also in here, you see some of these, these machines, which you would expect to be bought by contractors or, or mines and quarries or whatever, like um, dozers and, and dump trucks and so on. So it, it is very interesting exercise to kind of dive into this stuff in, in any given country and just understand the profile and, and sort of the fleet composition that this data suggests. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, agriculture is important in the UK. Um, in terms of the machines we cover, it's, it's very much about telehandlers. But of course, on top of that, you've, you've obviously got a very big market for agricultural tractors, which is outside the scope of what we're looking at today. Um, and the other one that we've identified as surprisingly significant in, in the UK is, is the waste management demolition uh, kind of industry, where, where crawler excavators are obviously an important machine, but um, when it comes to sort of handling and, and managing waste, you, you find that wheel loaders and, and wheeled excavators are, are important machines. And obviously there you're talking about settings where there's, um, there's often hard standing, these sort of permanent waste transfer sites and waste management sites. So you need a wheeled machine to, to operate on, on those hard paved surfaces, surfaces rather. Um, so just, uh, just finally in closing, um, I do want to make a few points about machine population. Um, this is not something that is very easy to get a handle on in the construction equipment industry. Um, because really nowhere in the world is there a requirement to register new machines uh, when, they, when they're sold, uh, nor to register their scrappage. So with, with machine populations, you're, you're always estimating. Um, and we, we do that, or we advocate an approach of take, making an assumption about the average life of each machine type, and then just adding up as, as a rolling total the, the appropriate number of years for that. Um, so this is something that, that we do on a fairly regular basis, and we have quite a lot of clients who are interested in this uh, because they're more in the aftermarket, so the, the population is, is the number they need to know. Um, so what, what we're starting to do with this data is, is also to look at how the population is shifting between the customer groups, um, which, you know, again, gives you a different perspective on the market and also can give you a different way of modeling things because you can take the view that maybe machines in rental fleets are highly utilized and have a short life but the same machine in a contractor fleet would would maybe be less utilized and, and live for longer um so yeah if you're if you're going to do um a model of the equipment population in europe um and you spoke to us about it we'd say it would probably look something like this um the, the population we would say at the moment is, is somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2 million machines in Europe. Um, and the, the, the big ones are probably what you would expect having, having looked at uh, the, the previous charts about what the, the annual sales are in Europe. Um, the, the point about this though, is that all these machine types have very different lifespans. You know, obviously a, a mini excavator is, is relative, relatively short-lived compared to something like a, a dump truck or a grader, which, which would be in this other's category. Um, but it does highlight the point I made earlier, and this is a bit of a digression, that the, the population of equipment in Europe is now pretty high, we would say, and that's, that's the area of concern if, if activity should fall away because these machines are, are also pretty young as well. So just for illustrative purposes, that's, that's kind of how we would see the population in Europe at the moment. Um, and then obviously you can dive into that in, in any, any sort of detail you would like. And again, just for illustrative purposes, I've just dug into the mini excavator segments where you know, we're seeing the population in about 420,000 machines across Europe. Um, obviously most of them with rental companies, but as I said before, quite a high proportion with contractors. So um, it, it is one of those interesting things that, that you can dive into and sort of start to understand not only how many machines are out there, but, but who owns them. And like I say, play with the model and, um, and, and sort of see how that sort of gives you different results. 
Um, so I'm going to stop the formal presentation there. Um, very happy to to take questions. I see there are a few things posted in the chat which we'll come to. Um, but but if you'd like to know more, if you have any follow ups from this presentation, or if you're itching to place an order with me, then then do give me a call. Uh, if not, please visit our website where we post regular news. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn or um, or do do have a look at the webinar, which is coming up in about a month's time. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. That was uh, extremely informative as always. And um, it's really interesting to see some of your new statistics on, on who's actually buying what kinds of equipment. I'm sure that's really useful to the manufacturers. Um, as well as just being of interest to observers like myself. I think we probably covered Nigel Shaw's question, which was, do you see rental becoming the end game? So is the UK a blueprint for Europe? I don't know if you've got anything to add to that one or um, a bit fairly I, um, I, it, It's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure I would see every market uh, in Europe or in the world rising to the same sort of level of rental penetration that, that we see in the UK. I mean, one of the things that makes me say that is, you know, the, the changes even over a period of 10 years are, are pretty small, you know, one or two percentage points ticking this way or that. So clearly these buying patterns and these buying habits uh, do take a long time to change. Um, you know, I, I think you would you would find that because construction is ultimately a very local activity and most most companies are small, um, it's really going to come down to to local conditions. Um, you know, one of the things about the UK is you can basically throw a bread roll and you're going to hit a, a plant hire company, so you can rent pretty much any sort of machine you like. And that's not necessarily the case in, in many other parts of Europe. So the, it, it's one of these circular arguments where the availability of rental is, is also very important. So, you know, maybe maybe one day, but it, it's going to be probably the work of decades if, if it goes that far. OK, thanks. Uh, one from Dale Council, who thought you were great. Uh, do you analyse machine cells by power source, e.g. diesel, battery, hydrogen, and if so, are there any trends developing? Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for that one, Dale. Um, we, we are starting to try and collect data on this. Um, I, I, think, I think realistically last year was the first year that, that machines were really genuinely commercially available, alternative energy machines. Um, and in Europe, that was that was obviously relatively small battery powered machines. Um, you know, it's obviously a technology that's been around for a while and we've seen all these shiny gold plated uh, prototypes on Shirt Baumer, but it has taken time for that to move through to commercial production. So there are a couple of OEMs that, that have these machines available uh, in Europe. Um, it's generally, you know, only a couple of models in a couple of equipment classes from a couple of suppliers. So the numbers are fairly low. Um, I would estimate probably between one and 2000 machines last year out of a total European market of, you know, approaching 200,000 machines. Um, but, you know, I think the point to make is that that is year one of, um, a journey which will, will last for decades. So I think it'll only ever build um, and, and these machines will uh, come onto the market in, in greater numbers from, from more suppliers. So it will probably uh, continue to tick up as, as the years go by. Um, but at the moment, you know, it, it is pretty limited in terms of uh, what's available in what machine classes and, and from whom. Yeah, th thanks for that. If anybody's in interested in this, particular area we've got a really good panel at Futureworks uh, on the 31st of March which will cover champions of, of many types of, of existing fields we've got uh, diesel experts but also looking at hydrogen and fuel cells and batteries and all things in between chip fat etc etc um, I've, I've got a quick question for you um, Chris well two actually if no one else has any how long do you think the market will continue to absorb 
um, price increases and price inflation before people say enough's enough. We know why it's going up because of power and commodities. But do you think it'll keep keep rising? Yeah, I mean, um, I think while certainly for this year, while we're still in this situation of there just being so much more demand out there that can be met um, by the supply of machines, you know, I, I think. I think we have another year of, of price increases ahead. Um, when it turns, you know, I, I think will remain to be seen. But but obviously, it's been sort of fairly uh, fairly aggressive for this industry. Um, you know, I, as I said in my opening slides, so we're now in this um, sort of situation where lawmakers and central bankers of the world have have come to the conclusion that. The inflation we saw last year was not just a flash in the pan of, of the world getting back to normal, but it is somewhat embedded. Um, so interest rates will will start to creep up. Um, you know, and there'll be there'll be other factors which will kind of slow down demand, and then when demand slackens off, it's obviously uh, a little bit harder for manufacturers to insist on a price increase. So I I, I think this year that's very much going to be the environment, but. Um, if you agree with the view that there's an economic slowdown coming sort of 2023-ish or beyond, then, then you would kind of expect the, those sort of pressures to, to diminish when that comes around. Okay. And just throwing this one in, uh, how do you see the um, developing situation in the Ukraine and Russia and uh, knock-on effects on the city, say in, in London with Russian money and this uh, gas pipeline probably slowing down some energy supply into Europe. Do you think that's going to have any um, effects on our sector? It, it's, it, it's one of those things that I think um, you probably will not necessarily see a direct effect because of the, the political and geopolitical tensions, but I think it's one of those things that kind of feeds into the the general economic soup. Um, you know, if if we're suddenly um, falling out with Russia up to and including the point of um, you know going to war over the Ukraine, then then obviously that that starts to have implications about um, not just the the international relations, but the the trade dynamics. Obviously, Russia is so important for so many commodity prices that that could um, very much send things haywire. So I don't think there's anything about the situation that kind of directly relates to the construction equipment market, but I think there's a lot about the situation that can affect what drives the construction equipment market. Yeah. Uh, comment from Paul Berger, uh, dealers all complained about price increases and yet for most of them, 2021 was a record year. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm sure for, for people like Paul, life would be very boring if, if their dealers didn't complain about price increases. So uh, I think that's kind of probably part of the rough and tumble of the year. But yeah, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the nature of inflation, you know, and it's not something that we've really had to, to face, um, you know, for sort of 12, 13 years. We've had this era of nearly free money um, and very low inflation since since the the financial crash, um, and we're I think you know personally I think we're now entering this era where uh, this this kind of way of life that we've we've been used to and this sort of financial uh, world is is going to change and inflation will be an issue for the the first time in in real terms for you know, 10, 15 years, and with that will go a, a climate of, of rising interest rates. Um, and, and yeah, in, inflation is kind of a, a, a sort of a theoretical concept, but it's something that's very, very real when you're trying to sell a piece of machinery, you're trying to persuade the, the customer that it's five, 10% more than, than it was six months ago. And, you know, all, all these kind of arguments that um, maybe haven't been, been had, in, you know, for a number of years. Okay, thank you. Um, there's no more questions. So thank you very much, Chris. Always good to have you here and uh, catch up on all the latest trends. Um, if you put a link into your uh, slides 
uh, your PDF that you've sent us about your webinar at the end of March, we can drop that in if it's not already there. We should probably have looked to the end of it, but I haven't. Yeah, I think I think it's all on that. that yeah. final, okay, cool. Final slide is there. I'm just going to do a quick plug now before we sign off. We've got five minutes left. Uh, for our future works ex uh, exhibition and showcase and conference hopefully everybody has heard about it has had some emails i know some of you have signed up for it it's the first real high-tech event we've ever done um, it's brought to you by all of us that deliver um, plant works to you we're looking at, at uh, machine learning ai automation which we call the human interface data for productivity and also decarbonisation, which, uh, as I said, is where the future fuels fits in. Um, partnered with some really good organisations, specifically National Highways, who are launching their connected autonomous plant uh, maturity matrix at the show, um, and with HS2, who are looking at decarbonisation of the job site. Um, and they're going to have some some big presences there. Uh, Supply Chain Sustainability School is going to be looking at uh, making construction more sustainable. And our friends at Commit to Drones uh, looking at how drones can help tie all the data gathering together. Uh, just updated the website today. There's lots of opportunities to register for different tickets. Big sponsors are uh, Spillard, Safety Systems, Data Tag, who bring you the CESAR program and Plant Force. Uh, as Chris says, Plant Hub, very important. And we've also updated the program for the two days, but more importantly, uh, keynote speakers and uh, other speakers and contributors. Uh, we've been supported by the Construction Minister, Lee Rowley, at Bayes, which is the business department. But we've got some excellent and really senior speakers. Um, some of them were presenting at, at COP26. Um, I'm not going to single any out because they're all really high standard. Um, but please have a look over at the FutureWorks website. Uh, you might recognise the name of one of the conference moderators, uh, Mr. Slight. And uh, on the exhibit side, it's been a, um, a difficult choice to find out who we got to exhibit. It's exhibitors have been by invitation only, um, partly with peak companies at the request of our partners. Um, but we've got some, some real high-tech products here, uh, some of them not even ready to go to market yet. But it's the theme that we've looked at is what's your what's the construction site of the next 10 years going to look like? Where will we be in 2030? So please pop over there. Uh, we're already getting lots of um, partner companies, major contractors, uh, academics, all kinds of people coming as in addition to our normal manufacturing audience. So something a little bit different. I think it's going to be really good. Um, and I hope that we all see you there. So uh, let me try and now go back just to let you know what's happening on the next. Uh, here we go. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. The next Power Hour will be on the 18th of March uh, and the speaker will be one of our National Highways partners, uh, Manir Akhtar, who's leading on the construction con Connected Autonomous Plant Programme. Um, and he'll be just giving a bit of a flavour of, of how uh, national highways are going to be moving more and more towards an auto autonomous job site. Um, so hope you will join us at that. Uh, so thank you very much to everybody for joining us today. Hope you found this useful. We will be sending out a link for you all and the presentation will be on the uh, CEA website in due course. So thanks very much and enjoy the rest of Wednesday.